back everyone to We Heart Therapy. You're watching the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Annabelle Bugatti. I'm a certified EFT therapist and a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Las Vegas, Nevada. And we are covering special topics in emotionally focused therapy for therapists. And we have a really exciting guest today. We have George Fowler. For those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting him or attending one of his trainings, he is an LMFT, a certified EFT therapist. Um, he's a certified EFT supervisor and EFT trainer. He's the president of the New York Center for EFT. And he also has an office in Connecticut. And he's really just amazing. And he has a very wonderful area that we're going to talk about today, which is um, really activated pursuers and kind of hostile pursuers. Um, George Fowler also recently wrote a book, and it's called Sacred Stress, and we'll have him talk a little bit about that um, before we let y'all go for today. But um, we just want to welcome George Fowler. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on our series. <laughs> well, it's a lot of fun to be here. I appreciate it. Excellent. So for those who don't know, you were a fireman, right, before you became a therapist. So you really know a lot about, well, first you know a lot about the frontline folks who, you know, rush into burning buildings but then have trouble addressing their emotions. But you also know how to run into the fire emotionally as well, which is an area where a lot of therapists get stuck when you have a pursuer, I guess, Sue likes to call it a strident pursuer, um, but in more layman's term, this is a, a pursuer who can get kind of hostile or very aggressive. They're very, very activated, and sometimes they turn their cannon on you, the therapist, and start firing right. at you. So let's go into this and talk a little bit more about this. Can you share a little bit more about your expertise around um, these strident strident pursuers, <laughs> or however you'd like to call them. All right. I think it's very counterintuitive for most of us when you're dealing with that much energy and that much criticism, that much anger, which is really just a protest. It's because something's so important. And really, people need you to lean in and be interested and to engage. But it, it comes across so strong that most of us, our default setting is to try to calm it down, minimize it, and pull away from it which really just kind of accelerates it. So, and a lot of us don't get training on what to do with it. We really fall back to our own relationships, you know, what we've learned to do. Our brains do get hijacked. So the first thing I'm trying to do as a supervisor or as a therapist or as a human being, I'm trying to figure out where, let's say if I was watching your videotape, I would be, when I see a pursuer really getting agitated and angry at you, I'm trying to figure out where do you need help? Like where, where are you getting stuck? Uh, Lisa Palm Olsen and Marlene Best and myself, we come up with this model of supervision. ACEs is a, uh, an acronym to really understand, to try to help identify where people get stuck, right? Is it A, is it, do they have an alliance? That's the first starting point with anything, right? We wanna be able to have a connection. We wanna be paying attention to that before we get into any kind of change. Do you have C is a conceptual understanding? Do you have a game? Do you have a map? Do you have a plan when you're dealing with pursuits? Because I'm always surprised how many people don't have a plan. They just have a big heart and good intentions and think that's going to be good enough. And pursuers are going to chew you up and spit you out if you're going to do that. So we do need, we need a map, right? So is that C, is that where you need help? Or E, experiential. Is you have a plan, but you really just don't know what to do. You don't have muscle memory of working with emotion. Right. There's something about the anger that's really hard and you're just not sure what to do with it. Or S is the self of therapist. Is there something about anger? You know, maybe you grew up in a family that didn't do anger. Maybe you grew up in a family that had too much anger, you know, but we learn all ways of, of dealing with emotion. So sometimes that just takes over in the session. So the first thing I'm getting curious about is what's happening for the therapist. Mm -hmm. You know, are they leaning into the anger? Are they getting really reactive and flooded and dysregulated to themselves? Do they feel confused? You know, that's gonna tell us a lot in the area we're gonna have to hone in on. So if, that's a really, really great point. And if we can sort of go in there, because this, when the pursuers get really, really activated, especially when they turn 
to the therapist and then start kind of attacking the therapist, maybe attacking their age or, well, you don't have kids or you're not married or you don't understand us. You know, they, they just start putting their attack on the therapist. And even the most seasoned therapists sometimes can get a little activated inside. I know for me that people are comes out and I'm like, Oh my God, like if they're attacking my credentials, like maybe I've lost that alliance. And you start to question like, oh my gosh, have I made them so upset that they're not going to come back? And, and it can be a little triggering. And sometimes I myself have felt like I needed to be defensive, you know, and it can be, it can be really hard. And, and we're not just talking about like regular pursuers. I think most people can deal with a little bit of anger, but these are the ones that like really kick up that level of anger to the next level that you know it's really alive and it's coming right at you full force and this is often what their withdrawing partner experiences and imagine if that's how you feel that's what they feel but exactly. this is how we get into this place where we've got to be able to not get triggered or at least not get dysregulated by the trigger and be able to stay with them rather than get into our own reactivity how do we do that Great question. The first part, when anger is being directed at me and I'm on top of my game and I have a map and I'm grounded, I can be really curious about the anger. And then we just do our thing and it's not a big deal. But when I'm not grounded, that same anger throws me for a loop. So it is, how do I maintain my balance? You know, we're all going to be misattuned. All we have to notice is that we're misattuned to repair and correct. So I think that's the real difference between an effective EFT therapist and a therapist who's struggling a lot is the, you know, the, the good EFT therapist just notices something's off. They're a little out in front or they're a little behind and they get curious about that. And in that process, they get back into a place of attunement. That's really hard to do when you're really flooded and you're dysregulated. Right. So, so wait, so as you say that something comes up for me, what if your pursuer is giving you all the signs that this is okay, you know, like you've checked in with them, you've kind of shored them up a little bit to make sure that they can hear what the withdrawer is about to give to them. And they say, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm on board. And they seem really calm. And then the withdrawer shares and then all of a sudden like a switch flips and they go ballistic and you're like, whoa, this like fire just went <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. That's tough. I had a, uh, I, I think what you're putting your finger on something really critically important. It's so important for the therapist to be able to keep their focus. To me, that's the most common thing that I see. If I'm watching a videotape and I pause it and I say, what are you trying to do? The therapist is like, says, I'm not sure, right? They've kind of lost their focus. So if you're working with a withdrawer and you're trying to do a step three or step five, if you're trying to access disowned parts of self and you get buy-in from the pursuer to give you the space to do it because they're not triggered and they, they have the best intentions and they want to know their part in two. And then all of a sudden the withdrawer starts to talk about things that really don't make sense to the pursuer. And all of a sudden all that goodwill evaporates and, and that bomb gets dropped in a second. And then the therapist gets hit with that bomb too. Cause they're like, wait a second, you just agreed to let me do this. I'm doing a good job. And now you're, you're blowing this whole thing up. And many so, of us want containment. How do we contain the fire? Is that the right thing? It all depends. And most of the time, if you're trying to contain anger by, by telling people to calm down, you're not capturing the spirit of what that anger is trying to do. Right. I, I'm trying to figure out how do I hold my focus? If my focus is on my step three with a withdrawer and the pursuer bursts, I like to do what I call close validation. Close validation is I'm going to speak to it. I'm going to validate it. I'm actually going to respond to it because that's what the anger is looking for, but I'm not going to explore it because if I explore what's going to happen to my focus, then you, you pulled it from the withdrawer to the pursuer and I'm starting down a whole new road. So if a pursuer jumps in and says, this is ridiculous. You know, this person, my partner never speaks that way to me. You know, now it's, that's a forced interruption. I'm always paying attention to transitions in my session. When do I leave one person and go to the other? And when I transition, what am I looking to get? What am I looking to do? And you got to be ready for a lot of moves. You gotta, you, 
So when I transition, I'm being forced to transition. I'm going to this pursuer, and, and the gist of what I'm saying is, yeah, this is outrageous. I mean, this is not adding up at all. I mean, you're not getting this. You've never heard this. You've been asking for this stuff for years. And when you finally hear it, because you've never heard it before, it makes sense why your body says this is not adding up. I so appreciate you sharing that with me because that's critically important. And I got to figure out how to help you make sense of this stuff. But to do that, I just got to make sure that I'm still not really understanding what your partner's saying. So if it's okay, I just want to go back there to make sure I get more of this. But if, you know, if, if it triggers more and you feel free to just jump in. So what have I done with that? I, I'm not exploring it. I'm giving it lots of validation, but I'm also giving responsiveness. This person, they're in a tough place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's my biggest thing that I've learned. I think most EFT therapists, and I certainly have been guilty of this. We so want to get to vulnerability mm -hmm. that we, we bypass the secondary emotion. You know, mm -hmm. so it's easy to go to that pursuer and say, yeah, I can see you're so angry, you know, and, and I must leave you so alone. Can you tell me more about the loneliness? Mm -hmm. And even if they agree with the word, they're giving you primary words still in secondary affect because that, that reactivity, that protest, that anger has not been organized. Right. So that when I find myself getting to a place where I can really give permission to the anger because it makes sense, usually then the anger will shift. But if we do it prematurely, we try to go to primary too fast because we're scared of the anger, then usually it kind of continues to stay present. So there's so many good points in there. So let me say the first thing, just to kind of quickly summarize, is it sounds like part of the containment is in the validation. Of course, we're never going to say, okay, calm down, calm down, which I don't think most of us EFT therapists do. Containment is more like, Oh my God, how do I keep this from blaring out of control? And it sounds like you're saying through that validation, that responsiveness, right? Because they're looking to hear, okay, my pain matters, right? And so you kind of validate, yeah, I love how you said that. Yeah, this is so new for you. Of course, you know, this is so weird to hear. And of course you're angry. It doesn't make sense, you know, and that can oftentimes help. Calm. So let me, let me just add to what you're saying, because you have like most EFT is a really nice primary voice. Right, you're. I feel like just zenning out as you talk. My right? husband is perfect. His voice, and he hates it. He's like, well, I don't talk to you that way. <laughs> well, it, it really works good in vulnerability. Yes. But when people are in anger, it's real. And this is a big challenge for most therapists that I train. You really want to match the affect. The energy is really important. If somebody's saying this is ridiculous, we did it again, and they're in that angry place, and you're like, I know this is really hard. You know, this is frustrating. I get it. It's still too far away from their experience. Maybe that and can you know, be like, okay, okay, kind of. Right, thing. and that's what it feels like. That's what your, your husband experiences too. Anybody's going to experience when you're in that agitated state. And as a therapist, you don't want right, to you know, join them in and say, yeah, your partner is a jerk. I get this. You know, but it is important to intentionally raise your energy level. So even as I say, you know, I get this is really hard for you. I mean, here you are hearing things you've never heard before and your body's saying, wait, this is not adding up. So notice how I ratchet up my energy. Right. Because I'm trying to come alongside. It's a lot easier to come alongside when, you're the, when the emotion is matched as now, opposed to that's too much of a spray. Are you totally going to scare the withdrawer back into their cave through that? And they're going to be like, well, I'm totally freaked out because here I started to share and the pursuer got really upset. And now you're kind of matching that tone and then to like go back and go, okay. <laughs> no, I think that's a great, whenever I find myself having a concern, if leaning into one means I might lose the other, then I just make that process explicit to the couple. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, if I'm concerned about my energy and now I transition back, you know, I just speak to my withdrawer and say something like, and then, wow, that must be hard for you is, you know, we're trying to understand your world all of a sudden. Now I'm leaning into how agitated your partner gets and that protest kind of makes sense. And my job here is to try to do what I'm really trying to hold two truths and, and kind of make more room so you could find your way towards each other. So if that felt like a little weird to you, because that's always what happens and it starts to make you put up your walls, that makes so much sense. I appreciate it. So did that happen for you now? Now I'm just working with the live process. You know, if my intervention triggers something in my withdrawal, that's just giving me something to work with. 
you're really good at that. Well, of course, because you're a trainer. <laughs> That's awesome the way you do that. And it's so like smooth the way you transition from one to the other. That's, that's really amazing. And some of the other points that you brought up, um, I think, um, I almost can't remember now because it's so good. Um, you talked about, you know, kind of like when we're in, you know, stage two, but when we're in stage one and they have that emotion, you know, how do we, first of all, I think it's kind of important from what you said is for those who might be new to EFT, how do we conceptualize that anger? Because you talked a lot about we, we do tend to bypass the secondary emotion and go to the primary because we want to get so deep down, but then that can feel dismissive of the anger, right? So it actually I, can be a trap too because even if you get people to respond to each other in primary which creates more safety they feel better the therapist feels better but if how you got there is to bypass the secondary when they go home they're going to go right back into those triggers that are not processed and then it's going to just take over their relationship yet again so they really need help making meaning of why they take these defensive positions eft is all about repatterning and reprocessing so people can do it differently. We really got to see the opportunity in this anger. So it's a great question. And we pathologize anger. We see it as something bad that we want to get rid of. And yet anger is it's so adaptive and it's so healthy in so many settings. It's how we stand up for ourselves. It's how we feel it's strong. It's how we feel in control. It's how we create change. It's how we're heard. It's how we want to be seen. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff that anger is trying to do. If we see it as just something protect, protective and not helpful, then well, of course we're gonna to wanna to bypass it. But if you took anger out of our lives, our lives wouldn't be as rich. Right, so how do we, so I get, from what I've heard other therapists say is they're afraid that if they validate the anger, stay in the anger, they're gonna get, kinda of like they're gonna get stuck there. They're not gonna get the pursuer to drop down into primary eventually and it might come across as an excuse for their angry behavior, which is often quite scary to the withdrawing partner. So how- Say that out loud. <laughs> say that out loud. You know, to say, hey, listen, I know anger when it's directed towards the person you love really creates a lot of mistrust and a lack of safety and it creates distance in relationships. So we have to find a different way of doing that. And I've never met somebody who's angry who don't have really good reasons to be angry that their anger is their way of being hurt and trying to create change. So that's what I'm trying to help you too. How do you create change in a way your partner comes close instead of going further away? What do you think about that? Put it right back into your clients. As therapists, we hold all this pressure, like we got to trick our clients or you know, talk them into things, when all we really got to do is hold up the mirror in a loving way and say, I get why you're doing what you're doing. And it, we know where this leads. How do we want to do this differently? I mean, this is a collaborative model that's really trying to get our clients to be part of this process. That's really good. That's really good. And along the lines of conceptualization, I, I heard Sue talk a lot about anger, you know, kind of like a mask for pain or hurt that oftentimes people who are really angry are really hurt. And I've noticed this in my clients as well, is that the more hurt or an emotional pain they are, like the deeper, the deeper the wound and the less expressed it is, the more prone towards rage on the anger spectrum. Right. So talk a little bit more about that and, and help us view anger as, you know, an expression of emotional pain. Because I don't think other models of counseling really yeah. concept anger in that way. If you had a choice between door number one is I feel all this pain and nobody comes to my pain and comforts me. And on top of it, I despise myself because I have all this shame. I mean, to me, that's the definition of hell. Or door two is I feel all that stuff, but if I get angry, it gets me away from all those feelings. And it gives me a chance that if I can get my partner to do something differently, I won't feel all this. Which one would you take? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a no brainer how adaptive anger is to try to create change. It's a short term solution, like all emotions, that often reinforces a longer term problem. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, the thing with anger is the worst thing about anger is, isn't when it happens, it's not knowing when it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, that's what makes partners walk around the eggshells and not want to engage, which feeds the insecurities underneath the anger. You know, but I think as a therapist, we have to recognize, you know, the opportunity in the anger. How do we 
how do we see his chance to help people really understand themselves? These unformulated vulnerabilities, I, I feel people have the same, they don't even know why they're so angry. They don't want to be this angry. They don't want to be so negative, And yet they can't stop themselves because what's their options? If they say nothing, what's going to happen? Right. Absolutely. Nothing's going to happen. That's actually a worse feeling than what the anger does. That's why people fight because there's still hope in anger. And that's a big takeaway that I want, you know, viewers to get when you're working with a pursuer to recognize that their anger is actually their hope. I work with a couple I did a live in Ireland where the therapist said they were de-escalated and the pursuer who was a male who was really angry was no longer being angry. And they were so proud that he wasn't being angry. And when I saw them, I tried try to help him put words. He had just given up and was defeated. We took his anger away. You took his hope away. And he yeah. was just lost. Yeah. So I think when, when you notice what the function of what the anger is trying to do, it makes you feel control, makes you feel safe. It, it really is important. It's also a symbol of I'm still fighting for this because I'm yes. hoping somehow something will change. And I do find that often is that, you know, and, and I'll, I'll have some clients who are really angry and they'll try to not be so angry. And I ask them, well, are you actually expressing yourself differently? And they'll say, no, I'm just not saying anything. And I'm like, that's not what I want you to do, <laughs> you know, because I don't right. want to take your voice. I want to make sure that you're still expressing yourself. And that's often a lot of the really hostile um, or strident pursuers that have a hard time backing off of their anger from what I've experienced is because they're so afraid that there's no other way that you'll hear my pain, that no one will come to my pain. If I let go of this anger, even if I find a different way to express it for hurt, which is so new to them, they don't trust it, but they're deathly afraid. This is the only way that, that my anger, I'm showing that this is important that I can get attention to it. If I drop the anger, no one's going to pay attention or care or they're not going to address my needs and that's so scary and my, what i'm encouraging you to do is say that to your pursuers mm -hmm. don't hold it a secret like you understand them so it ha allows you to be nice tell them exactly what you're seeing be explicit about the process it creates so much safety right when we go to the dentist the dentist says i'm going to poke you right here with a needle it's going to hurt for three seconds i mean that makes the process more predictable so yeah. for you to say to the pursuer, I get how hard this is. You know, if you don't say anything, it feels like nothing's going to change. You only got this little sw small window to be heard. So you, every part of you wants to jump forward and take that space that you have the courage to fight for it. It really touches me. It inspires me. The challenge is if you keep doing that, I'm not going to be able to get your partner to come out. So I'm trying to hold both of these truths. And sometimes, you know, I'm going to get lost in that. So if you could help me. I work with a pursuer who would jump in all the time, you know, tell the partner was a jerk, I was a jerk. She was just so reactive and so strong. And I think most of the time therapists get thrown, but as you get, your map becomes clearer, it gets easier and easier to anticipate the person mm -hmm. shooting a bullet. So you can catch these bullets, mm -hmm. right? So what I wind up every time the partner would interrupt, I would, we have to stop the interruptions if we're going to keep our focus. But I would do some version of, I know how hard this is for you to do. I mean, it seems so counterintuitive. You wouldn't have survived if you didn't fight for yourself. So when you see things differently, that's the impulse. The last thing I'd want to do is tell you you're wrong for having the courage to say something. I think that's great. My challenge is every time you say it, if I'm going to explore it and give you the justice that you deserve, I'm going to lose doing the work here. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to keep my focus and you know, we'll come back to you in a couple minutes. But if you need, what I wound up doing, this lady jumped in so many times that I would actually just hold her hand. I'd say, just squeeze my hand when something's becoming too much for you. That's your signal to me that this is too hard, right? But again, I think it's, it's the main takeaway with anger is we really want to validate it. We want to honor it really. Because if you honor it, it, you meet the signal. The signal is saying, this is important, pay attention. The therapist has to say, I see how important this is and I get that. And that's not giving it permission. It's not saying it's allowed to turn that into abuse and anger. I mean, we need to be really strong. We are the safer, stronger, wiser other that creates safety. So I can both honor the energy while still kind of saying it's not okay if it bleeds into areas that are too much. Right, right. And I love how you talked about catching the bullets. So 
for some of our viewers that maybe are new to EFT and they don't know quite yet the concept of catching bullets, um, which is really where, you know, one person might launch an attack in session on the other or on the therapist, or they might oftentimes even in stage one, when you're asking them to share just some very lightweight parts of themselves about this is what I do and I'm really angry, they oftentimes slip right back into, I'm going to send a slice towards my partner's way, but when you do this or if you wouldn't do that, you know, so yeah. you talk a little bit more about catching bullets and especially when they come from those really strident pursuers, because that's oftentimes who we're most more likely to see them from. And right. what do we do? How do we catch the bullet? The, I don't even like the term mm -hmm. because it implies there's intent. In mm -hmm. my experience with most bullets, really all a bullet is, it's mistrust. Mm -hmm. It's just a protest that, you know, the partner says something here is not adding up and, you know, you need to see me here too. So how we, what our relationship is to a block really determines how we're going to respond to it. It's kind of like an enactment in EFT, right? If the enactment goes well, great, because it's the couple responding to each other. If it doesn't go well, great, because they're giving you the block. They're giving you the very thing that stops them from doing it at home. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a bullet. A bullet, they are giving you live, right in your room, the very mistrust that stops these conversations. Mm -hmm. And now we got the, the very thing, if you're ready to embrace it. Unfortunately, what most people do with bullets, because they're not ready for it, they wind up telling the person who shot it, I don't think you understand what's happening here. You know, I'm trying to get your partner to do something differently. And whenever you get angry at them, they're never going to do that differently. And you're going to be stuck in this negative cycle. So basically what I'm saying is you're wrong for shooting the bullet, mm. which, which misses the spirit of what the bullet's trying to do. So it's right. counterintuitive. It's almost like a judo move. You want to go with the resistance because they're giving you the very thing that's going to allow you, if you can work through that block, if you're looking for an opportunity to seize that block, that mistrust, mm -hmm. now you're empowering that couple to be able to do it differently. Mm -hmm. right? so, so if that pursuer says, this is ridiculous, you know, he never talks that way. And now I'm expected to respond to him when nobody responds to me. Right? You are getting, it's not that this pursuer doesn't want to respond. It's that they're running on empty. They're feeling deprived. When you're in that place, not only are you not being responded to, but you're being asked to then even give more when you've been given the whole time. There's a part of your body that says that's not fair. If a therapist can see that and honor that and give that permission, all of a sudden, the, 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 that angry pursuer starts to soften. Uh, I love how you say that. I, I love that. And... Um... Gosh, so many wonderful things in this. So oftentimes when clients do shoot a bullet, I like how you say some that it feels like it implies intent. Although from what I've seen, a lot of times it's in self-defense, right? We don't, we don't yeah. show up guns blazing, you know, with intent to kill. But if something comes my way, and that's often what happens is when you try to do an enactment and a client then shoots a bullet in return, it's because something triggered them. Something didn't sit right with them something triggered pain in their self-defense is anger. So when you, and I love kind of like looking at it as anger is, is like the pain face. And when we learn to see through the anger, not bypass it, but see that underneath the, the really heartfelt feeling is pain that they can only express through anger. It's not always so scary, right? Recognize, okay, they're in a lot of pain and they're expressing it as anger that makes it a little bit easier to lean into it because you know that there's something deeper underneath and then you can exactly. find out what's going on. And then I love how Aviva Rizal, who's also in New York says, you know, if it falls apart and they shoot a bullet, then you're going to tie a tourniquet bow when you've repaired, <laughs> you know, it's a different kind of bow. It's more of a tourniquet bow to stop the bleeding. <laughs> right. Exactly. But you know, often, That's asking a lot of the therapists. You really have to be focused to recognize this person has a good reason they're shooting a bullet, but there's consequences for the partner for the bullet. So you do need to put a tourniquet because you're the safe person. You've asked them to risk. Don't ask people to do vulnerability if you're not going to respond. If the partner can, it's not, not a big deal as long as you can as the therapist. But what happens a lot of times is the therapist freezes for really good reasons. 
You know, right. and then they wind up talking the pursuer to try to do it differently, and they try to coach the pursuer, and the withdrawer doesn't buy it, and the pursuer doesn't buy it, and before you know it, the wheels come off of this thing, and right. it's just back in the cycle. You're right, exactly. So to to know the good reasons and watch your tapes, the good reasons your intervention didn't work. Mm -hmm. Can you go back and repair that? That's really the big difference. Right, right, and and I love how you say that. Sometimes the interventions don't work because perhaps we're not attuned. Um, maybe we've asked them to do something they're not ready to do. Um, you know, and I think what often helps the most is again, just helping therapists to remember the conceptualization of anger through EFT in a way that, that helps us not feel so triggered by it when it comes up in the sessions, because if we don't remember that it's not their intent to hurt us and their intent to cut the legs out from underneath us but it's a reflection of their pain. Something just activated that pain and they're expressing right. it. Then maybe it doesn't have to feel so scary for us to lean in, right? Because that's what you need us to do. It's like, you know, a strident pursuer that's getting so angry in session and they can't be calmed and they're kind of, the fire is blazing all over the place. A lot of therapists get kind of nervous with that. And that's where self of the therapist comes in is, you know, is there something from within you that gets triggered by anger that makes you lean out. And in EFT, we need to be able to go into that pain. And you're really excellent at doing that. That's one of your specialties is leaning into that. Yeah. And I don't want to make that sound easier and shame therapists who don't. Because if oh, you no. don't have a lot of experiences, anger should throw you off. It's going to trigger your amygdala to go right into a fight or flight response. And then, you know, you feel horrible about yourself because you're failing. And then the therapist beats himself up for failing and it goes into a shame spiral. So I do think it's really important to, to recognize, to honor the good reasons we do what we do around anger. And yeah. really what I'm talking you know, there's, a, there's the event and then there's our response to the event. And there's that space in between. And that's what we're trying to slow down and stretch out to give therapists, just like clients, more choice. Mm -hmm. you know, so if I find myself, I was in a live at an army base uh, and I was doing some really nice work with the withdrawer, exactly what the pursuer wanted. And then out of nowhere, the pursuer jumps in and says, what the hell is wrong with you speaking to me? You're putting words into my husband's mouth. I don't even understand your accents. You know, what the hell are you doing here, you jerk? And I'm like, I didn't see this one coming, you know, a live session. And, and I was thrown off. Most of the time I'm ready for anger, but I didn't see this anger coming. So it took me a while to kind of reboot, reground myself. And at any point, I think what is really liberating for me is if I'm feeling stuck, I just start over again. And I just, you know, so I turned on and I said, listen, I'm not sure why you're angry. I know you have really good reasons to be pissed off. I'm just not understanding that right now. You know, so I really need to help you understand that if I'm going to help the two of you. So to the withdrawer, I said, I, you know, I got to get back to you. You did a great job. I tried to respond. I muddled and fuddled. But what I did is I was able to kind of access that curiosity that said, what did I miss? What did this person come in blasting me? And I didn't even see it coming. You know, it's my job to create the safe environment. And I was I missed something. Yeah. That is excellent and amazing. And that's, that's what I think is really going to help therapists you know, and again, if you're not used to working with a lot, a lot of anger and you get triggered by it, something to be aware of so that you can work through it in session. But, you know, sometimes even when you're, when you're comfortable with anger, it can blindside you when they Absolutely. come blazing. And, and I love how you say you, you basically just take that and, and put it out there and make it explicit and say, okay, clearly something just happened, right? I see that you're really angry and I'm feeling it, right? I'm feeling it directed towards me. What did I miss? What's going on? Something, something's happening here. But all those strategies that I have matching affect, I didn't do that. I was, I was not ready for it. You know, mm -hmm. so the most honest thing I could do is turn and say, I, I, I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I missed something. I got to help me out here. Let's start over. You know, and I think that do over therapists don't recognize they can use that at any point. And whenever you do that, you're, you're up and running in the now. And that's the big thing. People get lost with anger. They get worried about when it's going to happen, future focus, or they get trying to figure out, put the pieces together of the past. And they wind up not, no longer working in the present. They talk about last week's fight or what's going to happen next week's fight. I really want to work with what's happening in the room. And that pulls me right back into the now.
Right. And sometimes the, when the client turns the cannon on you, it's because they're not feeling maybe like we're really understanding them or that we're with them. And that's an opportunity for us to either repair alliance or build alliance and get back into attunement. Oh, it sounds like I'm missing something. Like maybe it feels like I'm not understanding your experience. Can you help me? Or it seems like curiosity, yeah. is like the route that can sort of help the therapist regulate their own emotions is, you know, of course we're all going to get triggered. Even the yeah. most, even the trainers get triggered, but being able to handle it by not letting it carry us away, but going into curiosity and allowing curiosity to take us back into the moment and trying to understand what happened because they obviously got activated for a reason. And that's probably the other reason why I love EFT is because we have all these logical explanations for everything as to why emotions blaze out of control, whereas other models don't. And so really recognizing that, you know, obviously if something's happening, there's good reason for it and we've got to find out. So let's get curious and go right into it. Curiosity is the key emotion for, for any therapist. And, but to give therapists permission, fear kills curiosity. If you're not curious and you're working too hard, you have good reasons for it, but you have to recognize that you're working too hard. So if you get triggered and you go into your head and you start giving a lecture on research or mm -hmm. steps and stages, if that's a way of rebooting you, to just calm you down, to take another pass and get curious, then that's a great intervention. Even if in the moment it's not what the clients need, it allows you to reboot yourself. I just want to give people a lot of, a lot of permission for their own strategies of dealing with these with these strong emotions yeah yeah so and i also heard you say kind of if in doubt go back to the cycle start start over and just kind of start mapping it again if you've lost your way yep precisely that's, that's excellent so and it also sounds like you know you're saying even though you yourself was a fireman and you're used to rushing into fire you know which isn't you know, necessarily the same way all other therapists are. Not everybody's great or feeling comfortable at going into the fire. And what it sounds like you're saying is that it really requires, again, a lot of work on self of the therapist to be aware, is this an area where I do get easily triggered? Is that something I can work on so that I can stay with these clients who might get really angry so that I don't get as reactive? Um, and it's something we can get trained in, being comfortable and in going into the fire, right? No firefighter starts off running into a fire. They get trained to run into a fire. Mm -hmm. Should be no different with a therapist. Mm -hmm. We have good reasons we want to talk people out of anger. But when you understand emotions, emotions are just a signal communicating something. Right? The more you tell someone not to be angry, the more the anger grows. Right? So we need training that allows us to become more comfortable. You know, so if I was a supervisor, I wouldn't just be talking to you. I'd be like, all right. Let's do it. I'm the angry client. I'm going to get angry at you. Let's see you lean into it. I know you want to, but you got to develop that muscle memory that actually knows how to kind of stay in it. Yeah, that's amazing. So do you offer trainings and workshops and supervision for folks around this specific area? I do. I mean, like most of us, my training schedule is pretty insane. But, uh, you know, this is one of those areas that... I find a lot of therapists are really good at doing primary emotion, but they see this as being annoying and something they want to bypass. And, and to me, this is so often the gold. To create meaning out of the very good reasons people shut down or why they get angry, that's the very thing that's getting them into trouble. You know, I know a, I know a couple really has de-escalation. Not when they know their moves, but when they can give permission to their partner's moves. So when a withdrawer can say to the partner, I get your anger and your protest and your criticism. I used to take it as you telling me you're doing it wrong, but it's just your way of fighting for, to create change. It's hard to tell the, your partner the very thing that they do that you hate that causes you the most pain, that it makes sense. But if you can do that, you've really helped that couple make sense of their defensive moves. Mm -hmm. Most therapists just move too past, fast past that one. Right, right. And really being able to validate those secondary emotions is really important. And, and I love that you said that because I did an interview with Sue at the summit and she said, you know, we're not just going to give clients some kind of coping skills so they can not be so nasty to each other when they're in a fight because we know that's not going to work. They're just, they're going to do what they're going to do, but we've got to help them harness it and organize it and work together with it. 
Excellent. Awesome stuff. So if folks want to book you in their area, if they're interested in receiving supervision from you, attending a training, how do they find you? You can just go to uh, www.georgefowler.com. That usually has contact information and my training schedule. Okay, perfect. And if you could quickly tell us a little bit more about your book and where folks can find it. A Sacred Stress is a, a cool book that came out of my experiences with 9-11 and so similar to anger. Most of us have been trained to avoid stress, to see it as bad. The best thing we can do is sleep and eat right and work out. And most people, if you're trained to see it as bad and negative, your body will respond to it that way. And yet stress is the very thing that we need to change and grow and transform. If you look at the greatest moments in most people's lives, they usually come about through stressful events. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to get people just like anger to embrace it instead of trying to avoid it. And it's, there's a spiritual component because all the science research and all the different spiritual traditions all say the same thing, that there's something really redemptive about falling and failure and pain and struggle. It's in those moments when we need people the most. And, you know, it's one thing to love your partner when your partner's getting it right. But when your partner fails is when they need that the most. And so when you meet your partner there in that places where they need it, that love is like the strongest there is. That's so it's amazing. all stories and examples of, of, of that happening. And where can they buy your book? Any, any bookstore, Amazon. Amazon. So it's called Sacred yeah. by George Fowler. Yep. Excellent. We, have the, uh, we also have next year coming out the first family book on EFT. Excellent. Which is gonna take all these approaches and put it into, you know, how, how therapists can use that with families. So good stuff happening. Great momentum. Do you know what that book is going to be called? It's probably just going to be family emotionally focused therapy. Okay. We have right. a great team together, including Sue, Jim sure. Farrell leading that. That's going to be really exciting. So everyone, make sure you keep your eyes open for the new uh, family EFT book coming out next year in 2019. Yep. 2018. 2018. 2018. I'm already a year ahead. Um, and guys, I'm going to post a link to George Fowler's book on Amazon um, and also to his website so that you guys can find him and look him up and get in touch with him. Thank you again so much for being with us today. It's been truly an honor to have you and to speak with you. And hopefully we're going to get you out to the West Coast to have some more trainings. Sounds like a plan. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, to our viewers for staying tuned. Make sure that you subscribe and keep watching because we have more exciting interviews on the way. Mm -hmm.